On March 16, 1966, Gemini 8 with Neil Armstrong and David R. Scott became the first spacecraft to dock with another spacecraft in orbit. It also was the first in-space life-threatening system failure for a U.S. mission. Neil Armstrong would, of course, go on to command Apollo 11, and David R. Scott would be on Apollo 9 and Apollo 15, and on Apollo 15, he became the first to drive on the moon using the lunar rover. Unlike the previous Mercury capsule, which was simply meant to get astronauts into orbit and back, the Gemini capsule was designed to perform a variety of missions and had a service module section that had critical life support systems, electric systems, and of course propulsion systems. The cabin was meant to carry two astronauts for up to 14 days, if you can imagine staying in the capsule for 14 days like that. Tough mission, and that did happen on Gemini 7. This, of course, is Gemini 8 after that mission, and this was simply meant to dock. You can see the RCS thrusters here and some of the life support equipment. Those are the retrofire rockets to bring them back. Those were solid rocket boosters, four of them, as you can see. Very tiny little things, but just enough to bring them back. And on the top of the capsule, there was the RCS pods. But this gives you an idea of the scale of the cockpit of the cabin itself. And imagine staying in there for many, many days, uh, just two of you there. Uh, quite a thing, really. Uh, quite a thing to think about uh, what they endured on these flights. Anyway, uh, here the engineers are putting the capsule together, and you can see the heat shield here that uh, would be essential for bringing them back safely. These are only some of the systems that had to work properly in order for the mission to be successful. Uh, here you see the capsule being connected to the service module section, which contained all the necessary life support and propulsion. To say nothing of the rocket itself, the Titan II ICBM, which would be launching them into orbit, there was also the matter of the separation devices, because there was so much to uh, decouple. That's a decoupler, so if you ever wonder about the decouplers in the Kerbal Space Program, that's how they looked here. And that's the RCS system, and this one was placed in the nose of the Gemini, and here we see a RCS test fire. And so that's what it looked like when one of those tests fired. And we'll talk more about those RCS systems later. The, this is the engine gimbling. And there's something vaguely Kerbal about this. Uh, this is the LR-87 rocket. It had uh, two separate thrust chambers. And this was at the base of the Titan II. This is the solid rocket boosters that would bring them back. This is the retrofire rockets being tested here. Unlike Mercury, the Gemini did not have launch escape towers. What they did have was ejection seats, pilot ejection seats. So they needed to test the parachutes to make sure that they could operate at the kind of altitudes that the astronauts might be expected to eject out during. And the actual ejection seats were tested on rocket sleds like this. There you go. They were also tested with uh, in-cabin static tests like this. There's a slow motion video, obviously. Clearly, there was no such thing as too much testing when the lives of the astronauts hang in the balance. And so we see that they even tested the ejection seats out of a jet fighter, which you would expect would have been obvious since, uh, well, the jet fighters always have ejection seats. But I guess these were super lightweight ejection seats. They also allowed the astronauts to simulate the docking using a Gemini capsule mock-up and a Gina target vehicle mock-up suspended, as you see here. And so here the Gemini has maneuvered towards the Agena. The Agena was another system that had to work properly. It was going to be launched first. It had to get into the proper orbit. It had to stabilize itself. And we'll talk a lot more about the Agena's problems later. The Agena would be launched on an Atlas rocket just an hour and 40 minutes before the Gemini was launched on a Titan II rocket. Another critical system, of course, were the two astronauts. And here we see a meeting with engineers and Neil Armstrong, the commander, and of course the pilot, David R. Scott. But before we get to them, we'll handle the Agena Atlas launch here. And so early in the morning on March 16, 1966, the Agena Atlas was ready for launch. The astronauts were, of course, preparing for their launch just an hour and 40 minutes after this. So here we go, T minus five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff. 
The video in the corner, of course, is video from the original launch for this mission. And it is from the NASA documentary specifically for Gemini 8, uh, named Gemini 8, This is Houston Flight. And so that is publicly available. Most of the video in this from NASA is from that documentary. And so we see here the first stage of the Atlas rocket, uh, the boosters plus the first stage, the boosters generating 1,040 kilonewtons, the LR-89s, and the first stage generating 300 kilonewtons, the LR-105. These Agena launches had tons of problems. And in fact, uh, the original rendezvous and docking mission was supposed to be Gemini 6, but the Agena target vehicle that was launched for Gemini 6 exploded during launch, so then they had to have Gemini 6A, the revised mission, rendezvous with Gemini 7 instead, but they couldn't dock together. So that was a failure. And then, as we see, the boosters separate here. Uh, the Agena that was meant for Gemini 9, the mission after this, failed to get into orbit. And then for Gemini 12, it got into orbit, but it had a defective engine, so it wasn't able to perform all the tests that they wanted to do, which mainly was boosting up Gemini 12 to a higher orbit. Now, if all these problems and concerns about the Agena, you'd think that NASA would come up with some sort of alternative and they did. They came up with the Alternative Augmented Target Docking Adapter, a tiny little lightweight version without all the systems of the Agena. And they launched it for Gemini 9A because the original Agena for Gemini 9 failed to get into orbit. Unfortunately, its fairing failed to separate and Gemini 9A only realized that when it reached the target and saw that the fairing was still sort of halfway on and so they couldn't dock with it. Okay, so here the first stage is out and now on to the Agena's own engine. And again, uh, this engine uh, was the one that failed uh, during the Gemini 12 mission and prevented it from fulfilling its uh, full goals. This engine was a Bell 8247 and as we see it get the Agena into orbit, it was a pretty nifty engine uh, barring that single failure. And now let's turn to the Gemini mission that's going to meet up with this. I have uh, selections from the mission audio as well as some great video that they took. Uh, here's Neil Armstrong and on the bottom left corner you see one of the launch feeds. We will also see flight director John Hodge here who was the first person other than Chris Kraft to be lead flight director of a mission and we'll hear him prominently on the recordings. So here's the Titan II, also an ICBM adapted for this purpose. And the core engine, we already saw the gimbal test, the LR-A7. Let's get the original launch countdown here, and uh, here we go. T minus 20 seconds, mark. I should mention that the Houston Capcom that you hear on the tapes uh, talking with uh, Neil Armstrong and David R. Scott is Jim Lovell, who was on the Gemini 7 mission, which spent 14 days, or almost 14 days, in orbit. He would also, of course, go on to be part of Apollo 13, uh, which had the second uh, in-space life-threatening system failure for the United States. The Titan II burned aerosene 50 and nitrogen tetroxide, which led to the orange flame that you see there. And its first stage engine had a thrust of 1,913 kilonewtons, burning for a little over two and a half minutes. And then we have staging. Understand you have guidance. 
The audio available for the recording was from the flight director's loop rather than the in-capsule recordings, and so that's why the, the ground communications are much clearer than what we have for the astronauts, and so that's the reason why I'm excerpting certain parts. It's very difficult to hear a lot of it. Anyway, here the second stage of the Titan II and LR-91 with 445 kN worth of thrust, burning for three minutes, brings the vehicle to orbit. Unfortunately, because I was trying to get into a very particular orbit to meet up with the Gina target vehicle, I couldn't show engine shutdown here. But uh, here are some of the maneuvers necessary for meeting up with the Agena. And the Gemini has quite an amount of fuel, but not so much that you can deviate on launch by a large inclination, for instance. Anything more than 0.1 degrees would be quite harsh to correct. And so it had to be a relatively close orbit in order to meet up with the target. Rendezvous occurred pretty quickly after launch and the actual docking took place uh, 5 hours uh, and 33 minutes after launch of the Gemini 8. Unfortunately they would not have too much time to enjoy the success of docking because the thruster issue started to occur only about half an hour after docking. The first audio we'll hear will be the only in-cabin audio that we have and that's thanks to the Gemini 8 documentary from NASA. And then after that we'll have mission control audio for the docking sequence and then for the first report of the thruster malfunction. Hello Houston, this is Gemini 8, uh, we're station keeping on the Agena at about 150 feet. Way to go partner. You've done it boy, you've done a good job. Do the thing. Boy, look at that. That's beautiful. See the dipole? Do I ever? I see everything on that fella. Man, that's great. Man, that is really slick. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. A bit of all right. Okay, the first thing we really have to do, platform parallelism, 650 to 710. And they're giving us the SPC loaded yaw maneuver. It looks like that nominal time. So they're going to give you that time. And I'll check your old status display for you. I bet those Lockheed guys are just jumping up and down. The yes, S-10 is on. Yeah. Okay. And you saw during that, and still in the corner there, some of the great shots that the astronauts took of the Agena as they approached. They spent some time station keeping, and that was part of the test and after that they waited for clearance from mission control to continue with the docking and so here we see the start of the docking sequence and we'll pick up the audio in a few seconds here. The prominent voice with the English accent you'll hear is of course John Hodge, the flight director. Is he docked? Okay, Gemini 8, uh, we have TM solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and dock. Okay. I think we're going to hold off this SPC thing until he does get docked. Okay, go ahead with your memory compare. Roger. Let's okay, know what you get out of that. Okay, we have a rigid light getting stop rigid now. Say again. Okay, Gemini 8, it looks good here from the ground. Uh, we're showing cone rigid. Uh, everything looks good for on the docking. Okay, uh, we're going to cycle our stop on switch now. Uh, Roger. We flight, we are docked. Back And he's really a smoothie. Oh, Roger. Hey, congratulations. This is real good. A series of post docking experiments was supposed to take place, but that did not occur because of the thruster malfunction, and here we have audio of that. Call him. Uh, Gemini 8, CSQ, Capcom, contact Addy Reed. Uh, we got serious problems here with the forward coupling and over amp, but uh, we're going to engage from the engine. We're rolling up and we can't turn, turn anything off. Yeah, we're going to have to turn everything off. We're going to have to turn everything did he say he could not turn the Agena off? No, he says he is separated from the Agena and he's in a roll and he can't stop it. Uh, in a file, I'm left roll here at the present time. 
CSQ, this is flight. Go ahead. Find out how, how much RCS fuel he has used and uh, if he is just on one ring. Uh, Roger. Okay, we have uh, 22 percent showing in the gauge. Uh, we uh, don't have any uh, yaw or, uh, or roll control or any control of the yaw thrusters. Apparently none of them. Uh, we do have, uh, apparently the pitch thrusters are operative. And uh, we're now uh, in roll, and roll jets and, and the pitch jets are in roll, so we're slowly getting uh, back to a proper attitude here. I couldn't quite simulate the exact thrusters Neil Armstrong used to stabilize the craft, but after that, there's no surprise, they decided to bring back the mission. And in fact, they expedited it by switching which ocean they would land in. They were supposed to land in the Atlantic, but instead that was switched to the Pacific. And so they were brought back after that. Thruster issues were a constant problem for the Gemini missions. For instance, Gemini 4 had a mal malfunctioning thruster that caused a fast roll on re-entry and a rough landing. And then Gemini 5 had an Ohm's thruster that stopped working on the fifth day. That was an eight-day mission. And then uh, Gemini 7, some of the thrusters stopped working a few days in. That was a 14-day mission. And uh, they decided to continue with that even though they didn't have those thrusters. But anyway, uh, the important thing is we got them all back, and here we see Gemini 8 uh, returning safely, and the rescue missions, of course, had to be diverted. Uh, they had to use the Pacific Fleet rather than the Atlantic Fleet, and so uh, change of plans here, but uh, they got that done, and of course, Neil Armstrong and David R. Scott returned safely to conduct their future missions in the Apollo program. And then, of course, there was the recovery of the capsule itself. Unfortunately, the thruster that malfunctioned, I believe, was on the service module section, so they couldn't discover what caused the malfunction. Uh, the ultimate conclusion was that it was some sort of electrical short. And so there you have it uh, with this view over the South Pacific. I'll say thank you for watching this presentation of this day in space history, March 16th, the Gemini 8 mission. Special thanks to NASA for the non kerbal space program footage and to Frizang for the Atlas Agena rocket as well as the Gemini capsule and Titan rocket.